Okay, um, great. So, uh, yeah, so this is now the third part of the lecture series, or rather, um, yeah, uh, a new talk um, on, on, on basically the same subject I uh, st uh, stopped with last time. <clears throat> so this will be about the Jungian symmetry in Jungian as, a, as, a, as an actual symmetry and planar n equals for super young mills. And also I will talk a bit about uh, our results on Wilson loop, which uh, in some sense led to these developments um, because they were somewhat similar in nature. We are still continuing on that, <coughs> as I uh, explained. So um, the aim in uh, in this talk, or in, in what I'll be talking about in this talk, is uh, to prove the Jungian symmetry uh, for integrable planar gauge theories. Um, and as an outline, I will uh, for this talk I will um, explain how you can view the Jungian as a symmetry of planar n equals four super Young Mills. Um, and then talk about some implications of that, namely um, how can you understand the algebra, what, what are the issues or problems there, and uh, what does that have to do with gauge transformations, and also gauge fixing. Um, then I will talk about correlation functions and in what sense they display this Jungian symmetry, and, and, and finally also about Wilson loops um, and how they obey the symmetry. <clears throat> so the general assumptions for this talk uh, are again that I will talk only about n equals four supersymmetric Young Mills theory in the planar limit, um, and I should mention that most results also apply to ABJM or perhaps other similar models um, that I uh, already introduced yesterday, um, but I will not mention this here. We we did check some of these results, and now a uh, commercial break. Um, so. <laughs> um, you're invited to uh, think about uh, attending this conference, which we will have next year. Um, some of you may have been to this location before. It's a nice, nice place in southern Switzerland. Um, the main interesting point you, you might take away today is that these are the dates, and this is just the week before strings. Um, this, this place is probably just along the way from here to uh, South Africa. Um, <coughs> You just have to define the metric appropriately, deform the metric of a round S2 to, to make this just uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, but yeah, I mean, just do remember the dates if you're interested. Um, it's supposedly, more typically it's a conference with many Swiss participants and uh, not, not such a big crowd, but, but the very pleasant atmosphere. Okay, back to uh, back to our regular program, Jungian symmetry of n equals four super young mills. Um, I never actually told you what is a Jungian, so I uh, I can do that now. Um, a Jungian is uh, is is an algebra. It's it's actually quantum algebra, um, and we can start with an ordinary Lie algebra, which is generated by some set of generators, which I'll denote by J, and some letter A. Uh, A runs over all the possible directions of this algebra. So um, if, if in this case, this would be some sort of conformal algebra or PSU 2,2 slash 4. So this uh, A runs over uh, momentum generators, rotation generators, uh, scale transformations, supersymmetries, uh, special super, super conformal symmetries, yeah, and conformal symmetries. <coughs> um, but these things obey a, a Lie algebra as they stand. So um, so they have a Lie bracket, or yeah, Lie bracket, which is defined by the structure constants, and the structure constants are, are those structure constants that you have for your particular algebra. And now I will extend this algebra by introducing another set of generators, which uh, which is the same type of set. I just put a hat on top, and um, then I impose that these transform in the adjoint representation of the original algebra. Um, so that, that also justifies why you take the same index. And in addition, there will be some uh, relationship um, which relates, uh, which is a double commutator uh, or double D bracket of two J hats, which is roughly speaking what you normally has, have as a Jacobi identity. Um, so this looks like a Jacobi identity uh, if, if you forget about the hats. Um, but here we we don't really want to impose a third relation where you have where you say what precisely is j hat with j hat, uh, 
You could also do that, but that's going to be difficult. Instead, we, we, don't, we, we don't write the relation of J hat with J hat, but rather it's associated Jacobi identity, and that's all you need. Um, and <clears throat> so this, this side of the equation would be what you find in the Jacobi identity. And now it's a certain deformation where you say it's not just zero, but it's actually a cubic combination of the other generators. That's what makes it a, a quantum algebra, a quantum deformation. These are only J's. These are, um, I mean, the, the level, this is what you would call the level. This is the, the, the zeroth level. This is level one. Um, and here the level is preserved. Here the level is not preserved. You might formally write an H bar squared on this side so that you say H bar has a level one and then the level would match up. But since you can scale this away, you usually don't put it. it, it it's not uniform in level. <clears throat> But, uh, but note, this is a, this is a uh, totally symmetric product rather than the, uh, the anti-symmetric combination you have on that side. Um, okay, so, so that defines you the algebra. Um, in principle, you can write further uh, generators um, by doing repeated commutators of J hats, and then you get to level two and level three generators. Um, and this relation here just ensures that all of these generators uh, satisfy the right relation, um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't quite don't want to really express it because this term will pollute everything quite quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, I will actually never again consider this relation. It's it's too complicated. Um, but there's another part in this algebra because it's actually Hopf algebra, um, and that's the coproduct. And the coproduct is something um, very useful if you talk about tensor products of representations, or for example, if you talk about spin chains. Now, if you have a spin chain, um, then each spin, or a generalized type of spin chain, each spin is something that transforms in a certain representation of your symmetry, and the coproduct tells you what to do with tensor products. So a spin chain is a tensor product of lots of representations and you want to be able to act on it. You want to find a tensor product representation. And this is a trivial coproduct that does that. It tells you um, if you want to act with one generator on two sides, you have to act in this particular way on two sides. And then you can repeat it. Uh, you, you again apply this and then you know how to act on three sides and so on. Now, <clears throat> and then if you do that, um, and you, you, you see what, what that gives. It just tells you when you want to transform a state, the tensor product, you will act on each tensor factor individually and sum over all. That's the usual tensor product rule for Lie algebras. Um, but you can also do something more exciting, and that's given by this coproduct of the level one generator. So there again, it, has this, it starts out being the same rule, um, but then you put something that acts on two sides. And if you repeat this, if you iterate this rule, um, this will basically tell you if you want to act on a tensor product, you will act on two sides um, at a distance. Um, and yeah, it, it doesn't actually matter what distance, but you will act on these two sides with level zero generators and uh, multiply that by uh, the structure constants to get the action of the level one generator. Now, in addition, there's also a local term coming from these here. Um, <clears throat> so, so this this will altogether act both locally and bilocally, but most importantly, this will act bilocally with some local contribution, which you could view as as a short distance regulator. Um, whereas this one will act uh, purely locally. So this is a symmetry as you're used to it, and this is something new. And we will see many examples of that in just in a few seconds. Ah, okay, so. For example, there, there's one uh, particular generator, which is called the dual conformal or the level one momentum generator, which is P hat, is the easiest one. <clears throat> it's easiest one because also in the conformal algebra, um, the momentum generator is the easiest one because it's just translations and that's easy. It, you don't have to do anything non-linear um, for it. You just shift coordinates around. And likewise, in the Yangian, the level one momentum is the easiest one. And I spell out the coproduct here. Uh, what it tells you is that you can write the action of the level one momentum just in terms of the momentum 
uh, the rotation generator and the supersymmetries and, and also the scale transformation. And these are conceivably the simplest um, types of generators you get in the conformal algebra. This is just the super Poincare algebra basically with scale transformations, which are also quite easy to realize. <clears throat> you don't ever have to touch the conformal, the, the, the uh, special conformal transformations, special super conformal transformations, which are always a bit, I mean, at least they are lengthy expressions. You don't have to do that. And um, not just for those reasons, it's, it's nice, but um, you can actually define this, this generator, therefore, for many different theories. Um, all you have to have is a theory with super conformal symmetry, uh, super Poincare symmetry. You just need a supersymmetric theory and scale transformations in order to formulate this p hat. And, and then, well, there, there are also these local terms which you have to somehow find. Um, but, but the bilocal terms are already completely determined, and not just for n equals 4, but for basically any theory. And therefore, you can, in principle, um, ask the question whether this will be a theory in, uh, in a bigger class of, uh, whether that will be a symmetry in a bigger class of theories. <clears throat> okay. So the next technical ingredient we need are field polynomials. Um, so let's start with field monomials. Uh, a field monomial is basically a sequence of, of fields. Uh, let me call Z1 and Z2 and so on. These, these are the elementary fields like scalar fields or fermions or derivatives of those. These are all n by n matrices. So when I write a sequence of those, I just mean the matrix product. And therefore, the ordering does matter. Um, you cannot shift this field to a different location because the matrices will not normally commute. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing that's maybe useful to know is that this, this product monomial is again an n by n matrix and it transforms covariantly under gauge transformations. So just like all the fields that gay will, set that Z will transform covariantly. If they do, then the product will also. And um, the ordering of fields matters. And, and that's maybe the first indication where large N may play a role because if you have many different matrices, many, many matrices, and the rank is very small, then there may be identities between different orderings of matrices. Um, but if N is sufficiently large, or at least as large as the number of matrices that you have, um, you'll never get into this trouble. And if you then say, well, you want to be able to consider arbitrary field monomials, then you should say uh, n is sufficient, n is just arbitrary large, and maybe that's one indication why the planar limit may play a role. <clears throat> so why do we consider field monomials? Um, well, because they, they are relevant for basically all the things you do in quantum field theory. Um, in the CFT, you want to look at local operators. These are traces of the fields, or you evaluate all the fields at a common point in space-time. Um, and you can do linear combinations of such things, so it's useful not to just consider monomials, but polynomials. Um, then Wilson loop is such a thing, because, uh, or Wilson line is, is a path-ordered exponential of the integral of the uh, gauge connection. And you can expand that in powers of A, and if you do, then each term is a, is a, is a polynomial of, of a definite degree, for example. Um, it's now not a local polynomial, but it's, it's defined non-locally over your space-time, but that doesn't really matter. Um, then, correlation functions of different fields. You pick different fields, uh, maybe uh, yeah, take a color ordering for them and evaluate them at different points in space-time and compute their correlator, um, forgetting about gauge symmetry, say, say which you would, would have to gauge fix. But um, if, if you just consider this to be yeah, just defined in, without gauge symmetry, then you, this, this defines a, a, the elementary object you would want to understand in quantum field theory, at least in the position space approach. So these are relevant quantities, and there you also um, the, the, the object that you put in the correlator is precisely uh, such a field polynomial. And last but not least, there's the action for the theory, um, which is the, the space-time integral over the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian is such a field polynomial at a given point x, and it starts with trace f mu nu squared, of course, and there are other terms. 
but but again, you can combine these as as some particular field polynomial which you call the Lagrangian, and you integrate that; it's still a field polynomial. Um, so all these objects are field polynomials, and um, now I can bring these two things together and define how you act with the Youngian on a on a field polynomial or field monomial. So let's start with superconformal symmetry because that's part of the Youngian, and that's something you will know probably quite well. So when you act with a conformal symmetry on such a sequence of fields, you will basically transform each of the constituent fields and sum over all the possible uh, places where you do. Um, and that's, that's basically what I told you um, that this co-product does. So it tells you act on each side of this tensor product and transform each side individually by an infinitesimal transformation and then sum over all possibilities. Um, so we can then use this co-product rule, um, and what we get is this bilocal insertion formula. So you act with a Youngian generator on a field polynomial. You will act with two conformal generators on two sides. Uh, the two sides can be at arbitrary distance, but note this side is in front of that side. So this, this will be to the left of that one. And then you contract it with the structure constants F, A, B, C, um, to get whatever uh, this J hat tells you. So that's, that's one contribution. There's a second contribution which works like that, except that you, instead of using the uh, level zero generator, use the level one generator. But the nice thing is that this term is completely given to you in terms of conformal symmetry, whereas this, this term, you don't quite know what the representation is yet. Um, Yeah, the co-product is co-associative. It's not co-commutative. Um, well, that's how you define the Youngian. You can uh, define something more general, which is called uh, quantum affine algebra. Um, and this would be a certain limit of that. Um, you. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, depends, of course. How, what, what do you mean by general? What What are your? I mean, that's the general prescription. The assumption, I guess, is that um, the underlying Lie algebra um, is a finite-dimensional Lie algebra of simple type. Yeah. Ah, okay. No, wait. I mean, um, um, what I could say is that um, normally, more, more conveniently, you start with this relation. You say this is what it's supposed to be. And if that's what it's supposed to be, this term here actually corresponds to this term. If you, if you don't want this term, then you shouldn't have this term because here there's an h, h bar and there's an h bar squared and somehow the two talk to each other. If you don't have this term, the algebra will just be a loop algebra. So the model is a loop algebra and you want to de deform a loop algebra. The question you should ask is what are the deformations of loop algebras? Um, and deformations in a sense, non-trivial deformations. And, the non-trivial deformation basically is the quantum affine algebra. Um, and there are some other, other more conventional deformations which you can do. But there, there is, there's this quantum affine uh, usual deformation. Um, well, it does. Um, as I say, uh, the quantum F, if you take the quantum affine algebra and send the parameter back to its undeformed value and you and you do a proper contraction of it, you get this algebra. Yeah, yeah. That, that, um, that does play a role um, for, it does play a role for um, ADS-CFT where string theory lives on, on eta or on lambda-deformed backgrounds. That's sort of the algebra you need for that case. 
That's a deformation of the background, and uh, here it corresponds to a deformation of the algebra. In some sense, mathematically, these uh, quantum affine algebras are perhaps easier to treat, but here I want to um, use uh, sort of the maximal conformal symmetry as a starting point, and therefore we can also do this for n equals four super young mills. If you if you wanted to quantum deform that, this would probably be a, a gauge theory on a non-commutative type of space, and that might that you could probably define. It's perhaps you are not so used to it, and I'm not used to it. So, okay. So here, this is how you act on on field monomials, and basically it. In principle, that's how you should act on all of these quantities. Um, but there are some issues, namely, um, well, this, this local term here, to some extent, you could view it as, uh, as the completion of the bilocal terms when they just come too close to each other. When, when they act on a single side, you have to say what, what happens. Or when they come just too close, is there something you should correct it by? This is basically summarized by such a term. Um, <clears throat> and the other issue is that these uh, generators act in a nonlinear fashion. Um, this one certainly does, um, and this one, uh, we don't know what it is, but it, it does as well. Now, what does that mean? Um, I have a slide on that. I don't really have a slide, but what it means is if you act with a generator on a single field, um, typically, you will get back a single field, but you might also get back two fields. And the easiest way to see this is if, for example, you take the momentum generator. The momentum generator will be a derivative. But here you have a gauge theory. So in a gauge theory, you don't really want to use plain derivatives, but it may be more convenient to use uh, covariant derivatives. So instead of having p mu, equal, p mu z equals uh, d mu z, but you would probably add plus a mu commuted with z. And so a mu is a field itself, and z is a field, so that's a nonlinear contribution to, to the action. And that, that, that's something that actually complicates matters quite a bit. Um, and maybe, uh, yeah. So anyway, the, the aim of this uh, project was to show uh, the Youngian invariance of the action. <clears throat> so the action is a polynomial, j hat is what Ever this j hat is, and we want to define this. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, some features of the action that are essential in doing that is that the action is a single trace object, so it has the topology of a disk, and therefore, um, yeah, that that's one case where integrable integrability applies well. Um, it's uh, it's a conformal object that is it's conformally invariant. It's also finite. It does not receive anomalies, um, and the conformal symmetry of the action is quite important because that already tells you that j on s is zero, um, which in fact you bo both need j equals zero and j hat equals zero. Um, so, so that's good, but um, we still need to show that j hat is zero. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's a cyclic polynomial, it's an integrated polynomial, and it's a non-homogeneous polynomial. Cyclic means you have cyclicity of the trace, which is perhaps the easiest thing to consider. Integrated means you integrate the Lagrangian, um, which is not so bad, but it means that uh, if you don't care about boundary contributions, which to first approximation you probably shouldn't, um, then all um, total derivative terms you should discard. So. You have to throw away some terms sometimes, and um, that makes any practical calculation a bit more complicated. Um, and then it's a non-homogeneous polynomial, so it consists of terms like d squared phi squared, which is quadratic. Then you have, um, uh, yeah, for example, some term for the fermions, psi, psi bar, and a. So you have a cubic term, and you have also quartic terms, uh, which come from a to the fourth or phi to the fourth. Um, and so you have sort of, yeah, these, these together with cyclicity, this, this makes, makes it cycles of order two, three, and four, which, uh, which are sort of not quite compatible with each other. And that, that in, in particular, if, if, yeah, 
that makes it difficult in particular if you have a nonlinear representation with bilocal um, actions. And that, if you try to put all these things together, you just don't really know what to do. It, the results, I mean, you, there seem to be many ways of defining a result and you don't know which one is the right prescription. So um, by doing what I, uh, what I mentioned yesterday, yesterday uh, using the equations of motion, we found a definition for j hat z, so the local term. And we also found a certain prescription for acting with j hat on the action. And it's not very useful to write it down. It's just a sum over certain terms, which are somewhat similar to this. But, um, but there are certain prefactors that you need to put in um, that depend on the length of the object you're acting on, and you don't really know why that is, but it works. Uh. Well, the thing is, um, yeah, one trouble that you can see immediately here is that um, here you sum over k less than l, uh, so k should be, in this case, to the left of l. But that only really makes sense if you have an open polynomial. If you have a closed polynomial, you, you can't define it. And what do you do then? Um, you have to find some prescription of how to deal with it. Now, this is all OK, uh, but um, you could still make it work. But the problem then is if these change the length of your state. Because changing the length changes something about the cyclicity of, of your operators. Now, something that you have to rotate three times before you get back uh, becomes something that you re rotate four times before it comes back. And then these terms don't really want to talk to each other and, well, just have to find a certain prescription for that if you want to act on uh, closed and closed polynomials. Um, and we, we did find a prescription which was exactly zero once you evaluate it for any for super young mills and also for ABJM, and a prescription which gives you not zero when the models are just anything else that you don't expect to be integrable. Um, <clears throat> and so in order to do this, um, you can in particular take a particular definition of uh, some generator and uh, act on the action, and that creates you lots of terms depending on how you how you count, if you count all index index uh, values separately, you may end up with a couple of thousand terms. This turned out to be the simplest to do on a computer, that you just uh, write down all terms, rather than trying to uh, deal with some index identities, just spelled out everything completely. And then we saw that with the appropriate definitions, everything just cancels out. And, or in, the, in, in terms of the action, it just actually integrates as a total derivative term, it just goes away. It's a boundary term. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's the standard question that you ask at this point. And um, the best thing I can say at this stage is that um, if you want to define such a thing, you need an ordering for the fields in a polynomial. Now, suppose you do this in SU2, right? then um, the product of two fields will be probably given to you by Pauli matrices, and then there's not a proper ordering anymore. It's, it's just structure constants of your gauge group that somehow contract the fields, but there's no proper ordering of the various fields anymore. And then you don't quite know what, what this is. Um, SU2 would be an extreme example, of course, um, but maybe later on in the talk, there are some more indications of why large n is useful. But, but, but you know, the main purpose here is to give you an ordering for polynomials that, uh, and this ordering you need to define the young n. I mean that's that's what you know uh, that's what people would have said 15 years ago, and that's what people would have said 10 years ago, and um, 
And maybe there's a way to phrase it like that. It's just not the way the world works. Maybe, maybe you find a way, uh, but I have no good way of, of saying why, why that would be a good way. Yeah, right. Otherwise, you have to find you have to find a prescription, right? And and then what to do with this prescription? You have to what uh, see that it satisfies the algebra. You have to guarantee that. I don't know. Um, right. I mean, yeah. What what you would pay? I mean, okay. You can phrase it maybe like that. You can say, um, uh, if I, if if you can somehow extend this definition to uh, to a theory with finite n, um, then the resulting structure would not be a Youngian, but maybe a Youngian up to one over n terms. Yeah, that that might be one way. Or you you can say you cannot really define it up to one over n terms. Um, I, I don't know. Just, uh, <laughs> that, that's the that, that's the definition we we found, and it seems to work quite well. Yes. Yeah. Why? Why that? Well, I mean, once you have J and J hat acting on the action are both zero, then this holds by definition. Oh, that thing, yeah. No, I don't know what that actually. I mean, well. Since each of these j's would act on the whole action, then then the first one kills the action. There's nothing left. Um, it, it's not a very fruitful exercise, I, I would I would say. Um, but in general, you should. I mean, what you can do is for this type of representation, you can see whether the the relation holds, and I guess it almost does. Well, the action, yes, because each individual one, I mean, the first one kills it, and uh, there's nothing to see from it. But it doesn't tell you anything. I mean, that, that's always the problem with invariants. If you have something that's invariant under the whole group, the algebra doesn't really matter so much anymore because it's just zero. Um, <clears throat> There is a you. Okay, what? Well, what we've done is uh, we've looked at at the Dirac equation, I guess. And um, right. So as long as you have n at least one, then you have fermions, and then you can do a Dirac equation for the gate genomes, basically. And you can look at that equation and transform that equation. And um, the violation you'll find will be n minus 4 times a term. And this, it gives you n minus 4 times a term, which you cannot really argue away. And then it works for n equals 4, but not for anything else. Yeah, yes. In this case, I mean, because it's, you know, um, but this equation does not hold for pure Young Mills anymore because there's no Dirac equation. Um, right, and uh, in n equals two, you have scalar fields. In n equals one, you don't even have scalar fields. I think this term might involve scalar fields, so, uh, well. Oh, yes, yeah, but then uh, you some, somehow change the action in a, in a different way, and you also change the representation of this algebra in a way, in a slightly, yeah, in, a, in an appropriate deformed way. 
These are obby folds, aren't they? Or uh, no? Okay, no, not not those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, NF, if it is large, I don't, well, the NC is large, I don't know, NF would be large. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I cannot, I cannot make a very general statement. All I can say is um, we have a structure which works for N equals four super young mills and which doesn't work in a straight way for the other models, but it doesn't mean that there might not be a different structure that works for these. Um, and for example, for the beta deformed, that, that would be something that applies for the beta deformed because this straight Youngian will not leave the beta deformed theory invariant, but you have to deform the Youngian in an appropriate way. That's always the question, that's always the problem with integrable models. You, um, it's, <laughs> It's not easy to prove that a model is just integrable, but it's sort of the best thing you can do. If you, if you find a way to show that a certain model is integrable, then you're happy it's integrable, but you'll hardly find a way to show for any model that it's not integrable. It's, uh, you can just see, okay, it doesn't behave as if it's integrable, so therefore it's probably not integrable, but um, yeah, it's, it's not a nice, decisive way uh, method to uh, to look at a certain theory and see whether it's integrable or not. Here, here there is, to some extent, you just um, use this prescription, act on, on the action, and, and see whether you get zero or not. Um, but if you don't get zero, then there may be slight deformations that you have to do, and then could still succeed. Um, but for those, in, for those integral models where you can show something, um, you can call this a proper definition of integrability. Um, you, may, you may as well call it something else, um, but the, the cute thing about it is that it does give you an additional relation. You, you get a theory with some additional relation, and whenever that happens, you better use that relation to simplify your calculations, and that's what all of this is about. You, you can call it integrability or you can call it something else, but it's an additional relation which you should use. Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's actually, I mean, rather than just going ahead and compute this uh, by brute force, there's uh, maybe a slightly more clever way to approach this question, namely in terms of uh, classical anomaly terms. And what you do is you say, well, you have a generator and you transform the action and whatever it is, you call it uh, A, let's call it A. For the momentum, for the level one momentum generator, let's call it A hat mu, so we have a mu index. And the question you should answer is whether this A is zero or not. Um, <clears throat> so in order to address this problem, you can use the level one algebra, which tells you that this generator here transforms in the adjoint um, of conformal symmetry. And if it does, then this A should also transform in, 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 in an appropriate representation. Um, so if you use, for example, that this, this algebra will, will tell you that this A hat must be momentum in, uh, translation invariant um, because P commutes with P hat, therefore A should be translation invariant. Um, P hat commutes with Q in this algebra, so um, it should, this should also hold, so Q on A hat should be zero. Um, and you also learn that, that A hat is a, is a vector uh, of, co of, of dimension one. Vector is, is quite clear because it does carry a vector index, and it's dimension one because P is dimension one and the action is dimension zero, uh, or you can also say the Lagrangian, so, so this A hat, yeah, okay. So, okay, now you use this here. Um, if you say A is translation invariant, then it probably has to be an integral of a local operator, uh, integral over all space time, that's perhaps the only way of, of, in which you make, well, at least something that comes out of here um, to make this a uh, translation invariant object, right? Um, and O should be a local operator. 
And this operator now has dimension five because you have added dimension four from, from the integral here. And it's still a vector operator. And this condition here tells you um, this guy should be uh, the top component of a super multiplet. Because if you hit it another time with the supersymmetry, uh, you'll produce something that's zero or integrates to zero is a total derivative. Um, and that's what, what you call a top component of a super multiplet. <clears throat> or super. Yeah, it's a super multiplet because here you look at the uh, supersymmetry algebra. But then if you look at n equals 4 super young mills, you know that uh, most of the top components of multiplets live in dimension 10 or higher. That's because a, a multiplet ranges over eight dimensions. Um, and it starts, the, the lowest one will be roughly two. So um, you have to have at least dimension 10. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this, this thing you're interested in is a dimension five vector operator. Um, Okay, but there are also short supermultiplets which can have top components at, uh, at, at lower, uh, lower dimension. For instance, of course, the Lagrangian is such a top component of a supermultiplet, and um, that thing is, uh, yeah, that has dimension four. But um, if you scan through the table of super short supermultiplets that, that are, have reasonably uh, low dimension, then you see that there is no such supermultiplet that has this as a top component. And therefore, um, this A cannot exist and has to be zero. That's, a, that's one way of putting it. Um, there's even a better version of that, which I, where, where you do an extension of the symmetry, and uh, well, I'm not going to discuss this today. Um, okay. Uh, then. Uh, Right. Oh, that's, yeah, but um, if you have it for one uh, J hat, um, you can do, you can use the adjoint property and go through everything. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, the algebra is a tricky, tricky animal, so to be a bit more careful than that, but uh, at least for the purposes of this talk, maybe that suffices. Now, <clears throat> we've shown the, the symmetry in the classical action. Um, what are the implications then for the quantum theory? Um, you might think, okay, maybe uh, for a symmetry, we have Noether's theorem. Um, so we have a symmetry, does that lead to conserved currents or conserved charges? Um, yeah, it's, it's not so straightforward because for Noether, you would think that the thing you start with is, is more or less a local thing, whereas here you have bilocal representations and not so clear how that works. But um, another way of phrasing symmetries in quantum field theories is to consider um, correlators of fields. These are the Fs that I introduced earlier. So you take a couple of fields of your theory at different space-time points, and you just write this uh, to compute the correlation function of those and call this a correlator. Um, which depends on all the positions and the certain flavors of those fields, which I don't really write out. Um, and such correlation functions should obey word identities. If you have any symmetry, they should, should obey word identities. Or you could just argue it's not even a symmetry, but there is some additional relation for the action, and this relation, at the end of the day, may have some implication on your correlation function. And so <clears throat> for ordinary symmetries, these uh, word identities look as follows. Um, when you act on such a correlation function, you basically act on it as if it was a polynomial. So you transform each of these fields. That makes it a bit more complicated correlation function where maybe even because of the nonlinear contributions, you have some coincident points and so on. Um, but well, uh, the sum of all of these uh, Default well, chain correlators is zero, and that gives you that's some additional identity on your correlation functions, some relation between the various f's, and and there are many of those, of course. <coughs> no, okay, um, of course, in principle, you can take this as your basis, and then um, 
whenever you do a correlator of, I mean, you can insert Wilson lines in, in the middle, and you can phrase that in terms of those, you'll just have to integrate some of those then, and all the gauge non-invariant stuff will just be integrated out, and you're, you're left with that. All I want here is, 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 a, is a fairly simple object I can act on, and, and then you can think about more complicated things. I mean, when you start to put Wilson lines between, then you have to sh say what are the shapes, and maybe are there corners at the, at the points, and these are various things I don't really want to get into at the moment. <clears throat> but I'm not going to ignore them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but um, I mean, you. the thing is, um, you need this topology, right? You need this topology for the young end to work. Um, You'll pick out the component of the one operator. You, you, in the CFT, you, you compute the overlap with the one operator. There's no op overlap with the one operator. It's all zero. It's, it doesn't really help you. The only thing, I mean, the only interesting objects you would be in, you, would, you could do is, is take correlators of several traces. Correlators of trace phi to the n you can do, but then it has a, then it's a sphere with punctures, and that's not disk. That's higher. That's higher genus. Each puncture is bad. No, no. Three-point function is non-planar. In that in that spirit of the Youngian, it's non-planar. It does not apply to it. Yes, but for the reasons I gave yesterday. It's, um, if you want to make use of integrability of such an object, you'll cut it apart into pieces, and each piece is better be a disk. You, you, you'll tailor your pants uh, from... Exactly, and hexagon is a, is a disk. And, yeah. Um, you can only apply it to the disk, is, is, is the statement I want to make. Um, and if you want to apply it to a disk, then sort of these things with a single trace are the things you want to look at. Um, you could connect them with Wilson lines, but then you have to decide what to do with those Wilson lines, and I don't want to do that. Um, I'd rather do something more nasty than that. Um, but anyway, just uh, in, in one or two slides, I hope I can explain that. Um, <clears throat> so for the Youngian, uh, I just apply the same rule. I act on this polynomial as prescribed earlier, so I will do this by local insertions or local insertions of something new. Um, and as I said, uh, well, I already get there here. Uh, if we do this in a gauge theory, we have to do gauge fixing, right? Um, and if we do gauge fixing, we'll actually introduce unphysical degrees of freedom. And um, uh, another complication is that this Youngian algebra does not quite close as I told you it does, but it actually closes onto gauge transformations. Um, as usual, most symmetries in a gauge theory will not close as you think they should, but rather they produce gauge transformations in addition. Um, those are not bad because um, if you focus on gauge invariant quantities, these additional contributions will not be there, they will just cancel out. Um, so let me discuss this. How, what does the Youngian have to do with, or does it mix with gauge transformations? So, <clears throat> for example, in, a, in an extended supersymmetric theory, you have Q with Q gives you a gauge transformation. Uh, I mean, so you take two alike supersymmetries. Normally, the anti-commutator is zero, but if you look uh, closely in an extended N uh, gauge, uh, supersymmetric gauge theory, you get a gauge transformation which is sourced by a, by a scalar field. Um, okay, and since it's a gauge transformation, it's, it's as good as being zero, but, um, but the same also applies here, um, you know, by, by, by translation, you see something similar, that Q with Q bar gives you P, and uh, so what does that tell you? Um, 
that that even the translations that that you have they they generate gauge. Um, so, for example, if you have a translation, ah, okay, well, yeah, exactly. So this this problem that you have here, you can even um, you will even see it in translations because basically Q and Q bar give rise to translations in this way. And then, for example, if you do a translation and commute it with any other symmetry, what you'll get is what the algebra tells you it should be, plus a gauge transformation where this generator J acts on the gauge field. That's just how what you get in this particular case, because translations are rather easy. <clears throat> and this is the gauge transformation, so you don't care so much about it. But there, there will be a problem if you do this for the level one momentum. Because the level one momentum acts on two sides. There is a certain notation in which you can say, this is what it acts like on the first side, and this is what it acts like on the second side. And then if you commute that with the momentum, the result will basically be such a bilocal com combination, where you have G with this one leg of P hat acting on A, and the second leg acting on, on on the state straightforwardly. Now, this is not a gauge transformation because it's a bilocal thing, but one of the two legs is a gauge transformation. And what does that tell you? Now, <clears throat> of course, you can say P with S, P on S, uh, so S is gauge invariant, um, is translation invariant, and P hat on S is zero, so S is young in invariant, and therefore their commutator also annihilates S. Um, so this this particular generator, therefore, must be an additional symmetry of S. This is something you haven't thought about before, because no one told you to look at it, but um, it comes out of this commutator, if you just do it formally, and you know that it annihilates S. So it's an additional bilocal symmetry. Um, it's, it's like a gauge transformation, but it's not really an ordinary local gauge transformation. And what does that tell you? Does, I mean, does it mean that there are new symmetries? Um, how, how do you deal with that? So what's their significance? Actually, um, let's just consider something more general, uh, where we have a gauge transformation on one leg and, and some other transformation on the other one, and we act on a polynomial. If we carry out what, what this gives ordinarily, this will be a commutator of x or with this polynomial, ah, no, okay, sorry. This is what an ordinary gauge transformation does. If you act with an ordinary gauge transformation on a polynomial, then it will just arrange such that um, you get the uh, gauge, so the X field commuted with this covariant combination. That's how gauge transformations telescope, right? Now, if you apply the same rule then um, to this bilocal thing, what you'll get is uh, X, um, acting on J, acting on the polynomial. No. J acts on the polynomial and then you anti-commute it with X. So it gives you also a well-prescribed polynomial which basically leaves the fa uh, form of the original polynomial intact. Doesn't really change that, but uh, there's a symmetry J acting on it and this additional field X. And then the invariance of the action follows then from two properties. Namely, that the action itself is gauge invariant, this is obvious. But also, uh, if you say that the action is invariant under this J symmetry, then this thing will already kill the action, right? So, um, and you need something else, namely J on X is zero, you something want to act on cyclic things, you need that as well. But, um, but the interesting thing is that these, these two requirements hold for all superconformal gauge gauge theories. So what I want to say is this, this here is not just an additional symmetry for n equals false super young mills or for integrable models, but it's actually an, an additional uh, symmetry which holds for all superconformal gauge theories. There's nothing much you need for that. Um, <clears throat> and more formally you can say that this, this bilocal gauge transformations they form an ideal of the whole Youngian algebra. It's, it's some subalgebra which you can conveniently throw away. It, uh, it, it's something that um, gives you a less restrictive um, condition than the full Youngian because it's less restrictive because it applies to many more theories. It actually doesn't, doesn't tell you much about the theory. Um, 
it's like like gauge um, gauge transformations themselves. They will be an ideal of of a full symmetry algebra, and you can throw them away if you decide to act only on gauge invariant states. So here again, um, you can throw um, these parts, these these commutator additional contributions away, if you just decide that they act on own, they act, they annihilate everything. Okay, um, <clears throat> now the next issue is the gauge fixing. So my proposal is to use the usual Fadev Popov method. Um, that introduces an additional fields, namely ghosts, ghosts, anti ghosts, and B fields. And it also introduces some extra, extra terms in the action. <coughs> and uh, we know how this BRST symmetry acts on the various fields, so on an ordinary field, it acts like a gauge transformation using the, uh, the ghost as a source. On the ghost, it acts like also almost like a gauge transformation, but with different factor. And anyway, it, it, it has a um, particular uh, yeah, rule, um, which ensures that Q squared is zero. So um, yeah, that's, that's this feature of BRST symmetry, which allows you to consider the BRST cohomology. And um, so in particular, BRST cohomology works as follows. The, the action is a closed object under this cohomology, and closed means it's a physical object. It's, it's phys physically meaningful. Um, but the gauge fixing terms, they, they are even more special because they are exact. They, they are the BRST variation of something which I, I will call K. And um, that means uh, whatever those terms are, they will not contribute to any physical quantities. So they are irrelevant. Exact terms are irrelevant. Closed terms are those which are physical. Um, and if you then consider symmetries um, in such a theory, um, you have to relax your statements a bit. So instead of saying the whole action needs to be invariant, you don't need to demand that. The only thing you, you have to demand is that the variation of the action is exact, is BRST exact, which means that whatever it is, it will never contribute to anything physical. And then, um, so, so you say the variation of the action is Q on KJ. KJ is a certain residual term. In fact, you can just write it as J acting on K gauge fixing. So you just say, okay, uh, you transform this term by the symmetry, and that gives you this, this additional, I mean, this, this term you transform by the symmetry. And um, that, that's one way of saying it. The other way you could phrase it is that um, you'll act on, you, you'll have some unphysical terms, but this additional term here removes those unphysical terms from the relation so that everything is just uh, formulated in terms of the physical quantities. <clears throat> now, um, if you put this together with Youngian symmetry, um, you'll get some additional co um, yeah, complications because you know that BRST is something like a gauge symmetry itself. It's, it's like a residual gauge symmetry, right? In particular, it acts on all the fields as if you're just doing a gauge transformation with the ghost field. Um, <clears throat> but we already know that we have to enlarge the concept of gauge transformations in this theory by bilocal gauge transformations. And therefore for BRST, we should also look at bilocal BRST generators. And these would be uh, some generators which I could call QHJ or Q cross Q. This is, this is something which acts like a, a Q cross Q is something that acts like two BRST transformations acting at a distance in a certain correlated way. And then we can check whether these are symmetries. And indeed, Q cross Q, cross Q on the action, um, yeah, that already, uh, yeah, that automatically is zero. It doesn't really matter what the action is. Um, but for the gauge fixing terms, you have to pay a bit of attention. And <clears throat> you can show that this relation holds that Q cross Q on S is the BRST variation of something. So this is a BRST exact term. And so this, this is a new symmetry for your theory, which you didn't have before. You need the planar limit to define it, but otherwise it's a new symmetry. 
And then how about this one? Um, this one here, um, well, it, it's also, there's also some BRST exact term that comes out, but you'll need two extra terms to cancel off everything else. And these are, well, you could view them as sort of uh, uh, some extended BRST or bilocal BRST cohomology. Um, we don't really ex understand what these terms are in a mathematical sense, but we need them to, to make this uh, proper identity. And then also for the variation of the gauge fixed action, um, you'll need a few terms. So there's a BRST exact term, but you'll need two extra terms to cancel off things. Um, in any course for superior mills, actually these two terms can cancel by themselves, but for ABJM, you actually need all these three terms to, to cancel off all the gauge fixing effects. That was bothering us for some time because we knew that the, without gauge fixing, BRST was Youngian invariant, but once we fixed the gauge, we had additional terms which you couldn't get rid of, but we needed those two extra contributions here to make them go away. Um, <clears throat> so indeed, these, uh, these BR, bilocal BRST generators will now be needed to define the bilocal Youngian symmetry in this gauge fixed theory. And then, um, okay, so we fixed the gauge, and I think that um, addresses Rajesh's comment that uh, these correlators don't really make sense. Well, they don't make sense, but now we fix the gauge, they do. Um, they may not be physically relevant objects, but you can uh, obtain unambiguous answers after fixing a gauge, and, and those answers uh, should obey some identities. Uh, yeah, these are these are the word identities. You might also call them something like stuff of Taylor identities. Um, and in for for ordinary um, symmetries, like for conformal symmetry, these stuff of Taylor identities take the following form. So you transform the object, um, and you uh, compute the the correlator of that. Usually that's zero, but here you have to compensate by, by this compensator where you act with Q on, on the operator. This is basically a, a rule. Um, how you generalize such word identities to the gauge fixed theory. It's again, here, this is something like removing uh, gauge and ghost contributions from, from, from your result. Um, it, it, it holds from, yeah, by, by uh, yeah, if, if you know that the action is invariant under the symmetry um, and you use some variational identity of the path integral, you can easily arrive as such, at, at such a statement, right? Um, for the bilocal Youngian, you also get such an identity. It just has a few more extra terms which you have to deal with. Uh, and, yeah, um, they... There, there's this term, there, there are, there are, there's one term which looks very much like this, but then you need certain other terms which all, which, which involve all the extra generators, Q cross Q and Q uh, wedge J um, that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, there, there are also other identities which you can use to show BRST, bilocal BRST uh, symmetries of such correlators. Um, and we don't really know why these identities hold. Um, we just try to generalize this var variational identity uh, to something bilocal. There, there was a natural way in which you can do it, but we don't really have a um, we don't really have a good uh, first principles derivation. Um, the point here is that we, in order to make these identities work. Um, we have to restrict to the planar path integral. So we shouldn't perform the full path integral, we should only integrate over planar contributions. Uh, I don't really know how to do it, but uh, still we could come up with this identity and uh, it's, it looks like a reasonable generalization of that. <clears throat> it's not just reasonable, but it actually does work um, and that's what we wanted to show. So we looked at concrete correlation functions um, Let's test things for some correlators. The easiest thing you could do is, uh, is just a two-point function or a three-point function of fields. Three fields will interact with, via vertex. If you have four fields, 
they can interact via two vertex vertices and an internal line, or maybe the quartic vertex. And another thing that would be relevant to look at is, is a loop contribution. The easiest thing you might want to look at is actually a three-point function with one loop. So that's this generic contribution here and some other terms which, which are perhaps more special, but they all come into play once you have different, vert I mean, quartic vertices and the rearrangement of those contributions. <clears throat> you always have to restrict to planar contributions and color-ordered contributions. Um, but these are fully off-shell objects um, in the sense that the external lines here are not restricted to be on-shell or anything. Um, they, they are in fact position space operators. So you define three arbitrary positions in position space and so the momentum flowing through these lines is, can be any, uh, any amount of off-shell contribution. And that's relevant because as I, as I told you, um, Last time, whenever these legs go on shell and become massless, there will be infrared divergences and um, things become, yeah, I mean, you have to deal with regularization more carefully. Whereas here, we are just purely off shell and we just avoid some complication of single fields. These could be gauge fields, uh, scalar fields. Z is just any field. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, these are the fields that you put on, on, on those external positions. And those are just the plane correlators. Now I want to show the, the, the corresponding word identities for those. And um, we can start with propagators. Propagators are actually easy. Um, so for ordinary conformal symmetry, you act with the conformal symmetry on either side. Um, and since we want to stay at tree level, we only take the free contribution. So it's, it's the sum of these two uh, correl correlation functions that should be zero. And um, indeed that is so, there's a minor complication if you have gauge fields. Now if you two, take two gauge fields here, this will be a transformation and this will be a transformation of a gauge field, but then you still have gauge fields sitting around here, and the result doesn't ha actually have to be zero. It can also correspond to a gauge transformation. These, these are the extra terms that I mentioned. You can express that also in terms of ghosts uh, if you wanted, um, but you can also say the, there's a residual um, yeah, term. But importantly, um, one of the two, two uh, uh, sides here has to be a total derivative. You can do the same for the, Young, for, for the Youngian symmetry. For the Youngian symmetry, and if you have just two fields, you will just act on the two fields from, with, with the bilocal contribution. So this is uh, J, A, Z1, J, B, Z2, contracted with the structure constants. And ordinarily that's zero for most fields, but whenever one of the fields, or maybe both fields are gauge fields, um, you will get a gauge transformation, and this turns out to be the uh, residual result that you get. Um, but you can still interpret this as a sort of gauge transformation here. So <coughs> the level one generators almost annihilate, oh, well, they, all, they annihilate all propagators, but the gauge propagator has something, some extra terms. And, you know, if, if, you, if you apply this then to a certain correlation function, that causes you some problems because some terms may, may survive. So let's just do this um, modulo all sorts of gauge transformations because, yeah, um, you, can, you can do this more properly, but uh, let's not do that. So when we do this for an ordinary conformal transformation now, you get some problem with the nonlinear transformations. So if you act on three fields, you will act on the first field with a, with a linear contribution, on the second field with linear, or third field with linear contribution. But you may as well uh, turn one field into two fields with, with the generators. As I told you, um, there are nonlinear contributions. So what it means is all of a sudden you don't have a single field at this side, but two. And if you want to stay at the same perturbative order, there's one sort of one coupling constant sitting here for this vertex. But also splitting one field into two introduces one uh, coupling constant, G Young Mills, basically for counting purposes. 
least. And so uh, this would be a diagram which you also take into account. But, but now since you have two fields here, you cannot have any more internal vertices and these, this field must contract there and this field must contract there. And same if you do it to the other sides. Now you have six diagrams and they all look slightly different. Um, how can you relate them? Well, one thing is you use this identity to shift propagators across, uh, to shift symmetries from one end to the other of a propagator. So you shift all these to the middle of the diagram. And there's another trick you can use for this one. Um, namely, you say, well, this vertex here sits here directly on the external point. Um, but you don't want that. Uh, instead, you just say, these are two separate points connected by a delta four. Delta four x minus y, you integrate over the internal point that will just force this point to be, to be uh, at, at the external point. Um, but how do you represent delta four? You use the equation of motion. You say, you use, um, what's that, Green's identity basically, um, which says that the, that d squared, say, of phi, uh, what's that? Yeah, I guess d, d squared of phi is, is the source for phi or something. Um, or no, d, well, okay, d squared of the propagator of a field, of a scalar field, will be delta four. Yeah, you use that, you just insert it, and so you can write this as a two vertex, uh, as, as a, as a quadratic part of the vertex, that's, that's the d squared part, um, with a propagator. So all of these, uh, even though they look like a degenerate diagram, you can push it to the middle of the diagram and let some vertex act on a, on a two-point vertex. And then you have six diagrams which all have some internal vertex uh, operated on, and that's precisely the combination you have for invariance of the action. So that's how you get to this, if I mean by pedestrian methods, how you get to this uh, ward identity and show that this is zero. It's zero just precisely because the action is invariant. But you've used this, these uh, transformations here. And you can do this proper for the properly gauge fixed correlator, you'll just end up uh, having many, many more terms, like maybe three or five, five times more terms which at the end of the day all cancel. Um, but, you know, these are sort of unaffected by the gauge transformation business, gauge fixing business. No, these are all, well, these are, these are single fields. These become a bit of composite opposite operators when, oh, the tra yeah, this, this means you have color ordering of the X of the field, yeah. It's, you know, it's not very gauge invariant, but you need that, you need that topology to make sense of things. So, um, three-point function uh, for Youngian symmetry, um, you do the same tricks. You just uh, apply these bilocal transformations and I just display things up to a cyclic uh, reordering of generators. This is the j-hat direct contribution and these are the nonlinear contributions. And then you apply the same tricks, shift everything to the middle, and then you uh, have, a, have a sum of four different terms. And these four, these four terms are precisely the, the terms you get from the invariance of the action condition. So um, therefore, this identity also is zero. It's, it's based on conformal invariance of the propagator and of the three vertex. This is something we needed for some transformation here, but also of the Youngian invariance of the three vertex. That was necessary. We've also showed this for a different invariance condition of a different H fixed correlator. Um, yeah. So we, we've done partial gauge fixing for this um, because there are quite, a many, quite many terms that you get just from the gauge fixing procedure. Uh, well, that's, that's just, you know. <laughs> I'll show you what you get. Um, <laughs> so let's stay at four fields. Um, four fields, you have this, these uh, correlation functions and you apply things to the external legs in, in certain orderings. And you know, just by applying the rules of, Young, of, of, Youngian, of the Youngian ward identity, you already get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 terms up to cyclic uh, 
recurrences, and then you apply the same rules as before and blatantly ignore all gauge fixing effects, and then you get zero. And you, you've, you've used to, to make sure this works, you've used all that you know before, that, you, that we've learned before. All of these uh, partial computations also enter here, and you get zero. <coughs> And as you asked um, what happens at one loop, now you take three fields at one loop, um, you apply the rules, you'll get something like 20, 20 odd terms um, with all different topologies and you'll have to play around and see that everything cancels. Now, there's of course one additional, one additional complication here is that some of these diagrams are just superficially and pra practically probably uh, they are divergent, so you shouldn't really do that. You should regularize first, and then you pick up some additional contributions. We, we never did that, but um, this calculation at least shows that there's no structural deficit you introduce into this whole calculation. Um, it's possible that the result is zero after you do regularization, um, but there's nothing that, that somehow pre prevents this from, from being zero. So at least structurally you don't do something wrong. How about anomalies? Well, um, yeah, there, there is not really an established framework for addressing anomalies in, 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 for such a type of symmetry. Um, you know, for anomalies, you sometimes phrase them as the violation of the conservation of a current. Question is, um, what is this current here? And it certainly has to be non-local. So how do you violate uh, the conservation of that current? And maybe you can use some cohomological argument. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that would be one way of, of doing it. Um, I mean, there are different ways of viewing anomalies. This, this is another way, and that's perhaps the most practical way of, of doing it. But you have to understand how to act on this uh, one PI action, um, which might not be so easy. So, um, yeah. But if you do things, do things properly, you should properly do gauge fixing. You should regular, regularize your theory um, the analysis could be quite similar to the classical one, where you say, well, what could it possibly be? And then you construct all possible anomaly terms and say, um, well, there can't be any. Um, but since we have to do gauge fixing and we have to do regularization, we, this argument might not just hold yet. Um, yeah. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I think there shouldn't be an anomaly because... Uh, integrability simply works at finite coupling and if there was an anomaly then the symmetry would break down and it might not work but of course we would like to see that um, um, so I could just let me see how many slides do I have there's not too many slides but actually quite a few um, for Wilson loops I've already mentioned it last time what what i mean um, so a wilson loop again you can expand as polynomials um, and you can you know maybe write this in a graphical way like this um, but one important aspect of it is the usual definition of a wilson line has some point where you cut it open you you define a wilson a closed wilson loop as a trace of an open wilson loop and an open wilson loop has a starting point and um, somehow this starting point uh, enters the usual prescription. Uh, you could just remove it, but um, normally it's, it's just there. Um, you could perhaps, instead of using just plain gauge fields, you can use the Malasena Wilson loop. Uh, it just doesn't really make things much more difficult. Um, and you expect that the, va the expectation value of the Youngian uh, vanishes, and this has been checked at our first order in, in lambda. Um, yeah, this is how the symmetry acts for Wilson lines. So um, 
you you take your, you act on the Wilson line by inserting um, as I told yesterday you you insert the the conformal generator at one point and the Youngian generator you insert two conformal generators at two different points um, and it's a symmetry whenever um, the expectation value of these things vanishes and for the contour we will use something smooth but something arbitrary. Um, one important issue in all of this is that the Youngian normally does not quite respect cyclicity. So the point is that the result will depend on where you cut things open. It's just for a miracle that, that this dependence uh, here drops out. Um, if you do the calculation at one loop, um, you basically insert, um, well, for, for the expectation value of the Wilson loop, <coughs> You just uh, compute a propagator between two points of the Wilson loop and integrate over all pairs. Um, for the conformal symmetry, you act, um, you, you pick, you, you act with the conformal generator on one of these insertion points before you compute the correlator. And um, as I told you earlier today, uh, this in, in a gauge fix theory, um, this will give you a total derivative um, of something. It, this doesn't quite give you zero right away, but it gives you something that is a total derivative. And if it's a total derivative um, on a Wilson loop, this one um, can be integrated all the way um, to a boundary term. And that, that's what sort of removes the contribution. And nicely, if this one, this, this side of, of this function h, goes all the way to this point here, you'll get something that is, that is finite for a Maldacena Wilson loop. And that's, that's the reason why um, there's no potential problem coming from here. For the, for the level one Youngian, um, what you get, as I said, uh, you get total derivatives on both ends. And unfortunately, the boundary terms reduce here. Certainly they reduce, but they do not quite cancel. You can see it as follows because, say, if you treat this here as a, uh, which one? Well, you take one point. Um, you take this here um, to be a total derivative then one will collapse onto two here, or it will collapse onto the boundary. But since there's the boundary, it will, just, it will just stop there. So you get one contribution where one and two sit together, and you get two other contribution where they sit on the boundary, because once this is on the boundary, this other point can also go to the boundary, right? Um, so you, get, you, you don't quite get zero from the Youngian symmetry, but you get these extra terms. Um, but you can adjust the young in, the, how the young in acts on the Wilson loop by a local term. And you would just say, well, the local term is supposed to cancel precisely this here. And you can sort of do this because um, this is now just a tadpole diagram. And you say, whatever this tadpole is, and maybe you do a point splitting or something, but you just have to make sure it cancels precisely the tadpole. And the tadpole is something local, so it can be you know, it doesn't really depend on the rest of the theory of, of, of what you have there. And, um, and then there are the boundary terms, which you may also have to formally remove, but at least this, this local term can be removed by supplementing whatever we need here. Namely, this is exactly this term which you need formally. And you can even do this with regularization, and um, then you get young invariants. You have to pay a bit attention to UB. Um, at two loops, you get certain different contributions to the Wilson uh, loop for the expectation value. You get these. Um, potentially, we can detect anomalies if we understand the Youngian transformation of those. Um, we probably need UV regularization to make things work. Um, and we maybe have to understand the extra boundary terms. Now, the extra boundary terms somehow relate to, if you wish, to all of these extra terms here. So this is how you... You can, you can say the operator on which you act is a Wilson loop, then this is the term I just showed you, and then there are all the other terms that can potentially contribute. And you just have to define them properly, what you mean by them on the Wilson loop, and that's sort of what, what we still want to understand. And so I guess that's, yeah, that's, that's a good way to stop. Um, there, there is a per, there, there's perhaps a way to redefine the Wilson loop in a more cyclic way, and then some of these terms which are superficially gauge, not gauge invariant, will go away, and maybe 
we can reduce the, the stuff of Tyler identity somewhat further, but still there are some extra terms that, that we may have to consider uh, to make sense of, um, to make sense of, uh, yeah, invariance of the Wilson loop. And so, so in that sense, all this gauge fixing does seem to have a purpose and just have to understand how it really works. And these are my conclusions. Um, so I've talked a lot about Young and symmetry of planar N equals four super Young Mills. I've shown you, uh, I've argued that the action is uh, invariant and you can use a nice anomaly argument. Um, and therefore this gives you a nice definition of what you might mean by classically integrable and uh, the same definition also applies to other models like ABJM. Um, then uh, I, I've talked quite extensively about the Youngian algebra and gauge transformations. The point is that the Youngian algebra relations produce some extra non-local types of gauge transformations. And uh, after you do gauge fixing, you have some additional bilocal and mixed BRST transformations which are completely new and not really under good control. But um, these additional terms are actually needed to eliminate unphysical degrees of freedom from various relations. And it turns out that the Youngian is compatible with gauge fixing in such an extended sense. Um, then I've considered correlation functions um, in order to show that the relations, the, the ward identities that, that we came up with um, actually work. And um, at least structurally, they seem to work. Um, and uh, well, there, it remains the issue to show that no, there are no quantum anomalies, um, something we expect not to be there, but of course we need an argument. Uh, and finally, um, in five minutes, I've tried to explain uh, what this Youngian uh, invariance means for Wilson loops perturbatively. At one loop, um, it's, it's still a quite an easy picture. Um, but there are one or two boundary terms you have to consider. But at two loops at order lambda squared, there will be many more terms and we're just on the way to see that they all cancel. Um, and maybe we can detect potential anomalies and have to argue why they are not there. Hopefully we can already see it. Thanks for your patience and uh, yeah, thanks for.